Welcome to Module 7, Kidney Replacement Therapy in Center Dialysis. This module is designed to help all healthcare professionals who give care to patients who have chronic kidney disease and require kidney replacement therapy in the form of assisted dialysis in the chronic and acute settings. We will describe this dialysis population, the dialysis procedures, medications utilized, and management of the complications of kidney failure and dialysis. We know that we share the care for many of these patients with you. It is our hope that the information in this module will help you care for them and communicate with us. This set of modules, Chronic Kidney Disease, What Every Nurse Caring for the Patient with CKD Should Know, is dedicated to the memory of Sally Burroughs Hudson, a past president of ANNA and a fierce proponent of continuing education for all nurses. This is the seventh module in this series created by the American Nephrology Nurses Association, ANNA. This module should be viewed in conjunction with module one. The nephrology nurses who have created these modules have done so believing that your understanding of our shared patients and their therapies will enhance our shared care of them and communication between us. As you go through this module, you will learn that the majority of dialysis patients are on in-center hemodialysis, and there is huge variation in their knowledge of their own care. Because of the complexity of their disease and comorbidities, they are at increased risk for hospitalization where care for their kidney failure goes on alongside treatment for the cause of their hospitalization. Many non-nephrology nurses will be participating in that care. And as you go through the module, you will see terms, especially initialisms, highlighted by an asterisk which indicates that that term is defined in the downloadable glossary. In addition to the narrated slides, you'll find a list of suggested resources for further information, along with links to the glossary, reference list, case studies, and a post test. Please see the final slides of this module for more details. Welcome to this presentation. The following objectives will be our guide in this module about in-center, primarily assisted hemodialysis. At the end of this module, you'll be able to describe a plan of care for the patient with kidney failure undergoing in-center hemodialysis, explain the care of the patient during the dialysis procedure, discuss the care needed between the time from uh, between dialysis treatments for patients who are hospitalized or in a long-term care setting outline the self-care that the nurse needs to teach the outpatient on hemodialysis and his family, and briefly discuss assisted peritoneal dialysis. The United States Renal Data System, the USRDS, is an amazing and reliable source of data about the demographics and care of our patients with CKD, especially with those with kidney failure who are receiving kidney replacement therapy. This map of the United States shows the density of the population with kidney failure in 2018. The darkest blue color shows areas where over 3000 people per million are on kidney replacement therapy. As you can see, the contiguous areas with elevated prevalence included the coastal plains of South Carolina and Southern Georgia, the shores of Lake Michigan, from Gary to Chicago to Milwaukee, the Mississippi River Valley from roughly St. Louis to Memphis, Southern Texas, the Western Dakotas, and the Central Valley of California. The lightest greeny blue areas represent less than 1,500 people per million on KRT. 
there has been a greater than fourfold increase in the number of patients on KRT since the mid 1980s when this data collection began. The figure on the left displays the number of patients with incident kidney failure who began kidney replacement therapy in 2018. The number of patients who initiated in-center hemodialysis for the treatment of kidney failure was almost 113,000, thus continuing a relatively flat trend that began in 2015. The number starting home hemodialysis was just above 400, but over 14,000 patients started on peritoneal dialysis the largest number ever observed, and an increase of approximately 11% since 2017. Finally, the number of patients who received a preemptive kidney transplant also increased to an all-time high of 4,000. Patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis or receiving a preemptive transplant constituted 10.9% and 2.9% respectively of those with incident kidney failure in 2018. The figure on the right shows the distribution of the prevalent population, reflecting all the patients receiving kidney replacement therapy on the last day of 2018. Some 485,000 patients were undergoing in-center hemodialysis. And for the first time in US history, there were more than 10,000 patients performing home hemodialysis. Those doing self-care peritoneal dialysis increased to almost 59,000. Finally, the number of patients with the prevalent the number of prevalent patients with a functioning transplant increased to 230,000 in 2018. So gratifying to see as it is the only therapy that restores the benefits of normal kidney function. In contrast to assisted in-center dialysis, you may see here that only about 70,000 patients do self-care hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. PD is predominantly a self-care therapy, except when the patient is hospitalized and either requires PD as an acute or urgent therapy start or needs assistance for their routine PD care while acutely ill. PD is extensively described in module six of this series. Because assisted dialysis is predominantly hemodialysis, this module will focus primarily on that experience. We'll begin by describing a basic care plan of care for the patient with kidney failure undergoing in-center hemodialysis. Most patients and centers schedule treatments three days per week for approximately four hours per treatment. You may hear this referred to as conventional hemodialysis. And the actual treatment is largely done by a nurse or a patient care technician. Hemodialysis literally means cleaning the blood. So to begin hemodialysis, the patient's blood is accessed through an arteriovenous fistula, an arteriovenous graft, or through a central venous catheter. Once the bloodstream is accessed, the blood is circulated through the dialyzer on one side of a semi-permeable membrane, while the ultra-pure dialysate is pumped countercurrently through the other side. This allows for the diffusion of waste products from the blood across the membrane and into the dialysate. Excess fluid is removed through ultrafiltration without the patient's blood mixing with any of the dialysate. About 250 milliliters of blood is outside the body in the extracorporeal circuit at any time during the treatment. This is approximately 4% of the patient's total blood volume. 
Due to the complexity of the dialysis patient's medical and social issues, each member of the interdisciplinary team is necessary to provide quality care. The nephrologist, APN or PA, writes the dialysis prescription and oversees the medical care, seeing the patient on hemodialysis about once per week. The social worker assists the patient with quality of life issues, such as coping with issues related to kidney failure and the burden of the disease, in addition to helping with transportation and financial issues. Dialysis care for kidney failure is the only disease state that is covered by Medicare without regard to age. In center hemodialysis patients become Medicare eligible after three months on of therapy. The dietitian primarily manages nutrition, including the lab monitoring of the patient's metabolic indicators and kidney related bone disease, which requires a lot of patient education and reinforcement. The nurse manages fluid volume status, monitoring the vital signs cardiovascular and respiratory status and treatment tolerance, as well as assuring patient safety. CMS regulations stipulate that no dialysis can be conducted unless an RN is present. The nurse also administers intradialytic medications and communicates with the patient and all healthcare professionals within and outside the dialysis clinic to ensure continuity of care. Nurses delegate direct patient care to the dialysis technicians who usually prepare the equipment, obtain the patient's pre and post tr treatment weight and vital signs, prepare the vascular access, initiate hemodialysis, and monitor the patient and the machine throughout the treatment. Nurses and technicians work together to troubleshoot complications and assure that hemostasis and stable vital signs are achieved at the end of treatment so that the patient leaves safely. Partnering with the patient and family is essential to ensure quality of care. Patients are encouraged to do as much of their own care as possible, either in center or at home. A knowledgeable patient is a more satisfied and healthier patient. While care of every patient is an interdisciplinary team responsibility, we know that it is the nurse who is with the patient more than any other discipline. We know that our process of care is not limited to specific medical orders for a specific diagnosis. Nephrology nurses use the nursing process in providing care to the patient with kidney disease. The detailed standards of care in this process can be found in the 2017 edition of the Nephrology Nursing Scope and Standards of Practice. The evidence base for Nephrology Nurses Guidelines of Practice and Process of Care can be found in the Core Curriculum for Nephrology Nursing 7th edition and Contemporary Nephrology Nursing 3rd edition, as well as patient education that will enable the patient to partner with the IDT and successfully self-manage their care. As with any patient education, it is necessary to be sensitive to health literacy and individualization of the approach while considering the patient's and family's cultural and health beliefs, preferences, and wishes. Some specific components of the dialysis treatment plan require careful consideration and monitoring. The following slides will focus on five of these areas volume status assessment and management, nutrition support guidelines and goals, medication considerations, vascular access management, and blood pressure management. Recalling that fluid volume balance is one of the primary functions of healthy kidneys, it makes sense that one of the major challenges of kidney failure is replacing that basic function. While there is considerable patient-to-patient -patient variation, the majority of chronic dialysis patients are anuric. As a result, one of the two main goals of hemodialysis is ultrafiltration, 
which is the removal of accumulated water from the body. Ultrafiltration occurs within the dialyzer as water is forced from the high pressure blood circulation to the lower pressure dialysate fluid. The amount of fluid that needs to be removed each dialysis treatment is based on the patient's target weight, sometimes referred to as estimated dry weight. This is the patient's body weight free of excess water, as would be the case for a person with healthy kidneys. Before and after each treatment, the weight of the patient is measured on the dialysis unit scale. Fluid removal goals are set based on the difference between the pre-dialysis wet weight and the post-dialysis target weight. For example, if a person's target weight is 75 kilograms and they come to dialysis at 78 kilograms, it is assumed that they have gained three kilos between treatments. And because one liter of water weighs one kilogram, we know that three kilos is three liters of fluid that needs to be removed during dialysis to reach the target weight. Typically, 0.5 to 1.5 liters of fluid is removed per hour during dialysis to, re to reach that estimated target weight. Recent studies shows that cardiovascular safety depends on no more than 10 mils of fluid per kilo of target weight per hour being removed. Patients should achieve their target weight by the end of every dialysis session. This weight is re-evaluated at every session and will fluctuate based on solid body weight gains or losses as well. Consider too that measured weight is influenced by many variables, including clothing and GI and bladder contents. If the target weight is overestimated, the person will leave with excess fluid. This may manifest as hypertension, edema, and shortness of breath or dyspnea on exertion. If target weight is underestimated, the patient is essentially dehydrated during dialysis. As a result, they may become dizzy, lightheaded, hypotensive, and or have muscle cramps. To be as healthy as possible, Patients on dialysis need to eat well. Their disease, comorbidities, and therapy mean that they need to make important modifications, particularly in regard to sodium, fluid, protein, potassium, phosphorus, and calories. Since kidney failure and dialysis cause catabolism, dialysis patients tend to lose solid weight. A primary goal of nutritional support for patients is to maintain solid body weight. In order to do this, most patients are encouraged to eat a high protein, high calorie diet. Most patients with kidney failure need additional protein so that their bodies do not break down existing muscle protein for energy. The daily recommended protein intake for a patient with kidney failure is 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day of high biologic value proteins such as meat, eggs, and fish. Sufficient caloric intake is also essential for maintenance health on dialysis. The dietitian works closely with the patient to establish an ideal body weight and have the person strive to achieve it. Because of the catabolic nature of kidney failure, patients often need to increase their caloric intake in order to maintain body weight and health. Since decreased appetite is common in people with kidney failure, protein and calorie supplements are sometimes recommended to meet these nutritional needs. Potassium, sodium, phosphorus and fluids must be limited in people with kidney failure to avoid electrolytic imbalances since the dialyzer cannot physiologically balance these elements. 
The dietitian is a valuable resource and will provide patients with specific dietary recommendations. Just as the dialyzer cannot physiologically correct all electrolytic imbalances, nor can it replace or correct any of the hormonal imbalances caused by kidney failure. Patients will need medication to treat the issues of anemia and mineral bone disorders. Historically, these are administered as part of the hemodialysis treatment. High blood pressure medications are managed by the patient at home. Functioning kidneys sense when the bodies need more red blood cells to carry sufficient oxygen to organs and tissues. Poetin to prompt the bone marrow to make new red blood cells. When the kidneys are diseased, they no longer produce adequate amounts of erythropoietin, which means the bone marrow receives less signaling to produce red blood cells. In order to prevent severe anemia and the need for blood transfusion, erythropoiesis stimulating agents, ESAs, can be given either via IV or subcutaneously, along with IV iron during hemodialysis. The goal of anemia correction is to prevent blood transfusions, but to not exceed a hemoglobin of 11.5 grams per deciliter. Dosing varies by ESA type and physician protocol. The potential risks and benefits of ESA should be considered for each patient before starting. ESAs you may see prescribed for patients include Epigen, Aranesp, Procrip, and Miocera. Nearly all dialysis patients will become iron deficient from the dialysis treatment itself, frequent phlebotomy, and sometimes GI bleeding. ESAs are much less effective if iron is not available to make hemoglobin in red blood cells. For this reason, iron supplementation is often given along with ESA therapy. Common iron preparations prescribed for dialysis patients are venifer and ferrolicet. The Kidney Disease Outcome Quality Initiative, KDOKI, recommends that hemoglobin and iron levels be analyzed together when deciding on ESA therapy. Since the kidneys can no longer excrete excess phosphorus to properly regulate serum phosphorus levels, patients must take phosphate binder medications. Phosphate binders are taken with their meals so that the medication can bind ingested phosphorus, which is then eliminated in the stool. This is important because elevated serum phosphorus levels are correlated with the release of calcium from bones, resulting in kidney-related bone disease, vascular calcification, and cardiovascular mortality. Dietary reduction of phosphorus and the use of phosphate binders help keep serum phosphorus levels in the normal range because conventional hemodialysis is unable to remove sufficient phosphorus from the blood. Typical phosphorus binders currently prescribed include Savelima hydrochloride, calcium acetate, lanthanum carbonate, and sucroferic oxyhydroxide. In kidney failure, the kidneys no longer convert vitamin D, which is absorbed from the intestines, into the active form of vitamin D, which is 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol, also known as calcitriol. Calcitriol increases the level of calcium in the blood by increasing the uptake of calcium from the gut into the blood and possibly increasing the release of calcium into the, bone, into the blood from bone. This deficiency of the calcitriol form of vitamin D results in stimulation of the parathyroid gland, leading to secondary hyperparathyroidism. Hyperparathyroidism, if left untreated, 
will cause calcium to be released from the bones and elevated in the blood. In order to suppress parathyroid hormone secretion, IV synthetic vitamin D analogs are given, which mimic 125-dihydroxycholic calciferol, vitamin D. These drugs will turn off the parathyroid gland and lessen the release of calcium from the bone. The most common IV vitamin D preparation prescribed for dialysis patients is paracalcitol. In addition, an oral calcium emetic is sometimes prescribed to help control PTH levels. This medication acts by attaching to the calcium senses, sensing receptors on the parathyroid gland so that the gland senses sufficient serum calcium and stops overproducing. The most common calcium emetic prescribed for dialysis patient is Sensapar or the intravenous form called Pasabiv. The patient's CBC, electrolytes, and serum chemistries are monitored on a monthly basis to assess, to assess health maintenance and allow the interdisciplinary team to adjust medication dosages. High blood pressure is both a cause and a complication of kidney failure. Disorders of the hormones that control blood pressure and the kidneys, inability to regulate fluid and sodium, lead to hypertension. Most dialysis patients will need antihypertensive medications to control blood pressure. Medication should be combined with appropriate fluid intake and a low sodium diet in order to achieve blood pressure control. For more information on the medication management of blood pressure in the CKD patient, please see modules two and three. Many drugs are contraindicated in patients with kidney failure and many medications require dose adjustments due to altered kidney excretion or metabolism. Generally, people with kidney failure need lower doses of medications. Conversely, some medications are removed from the blood during the dialysis treatment. Patients may need to take an additional dose of medication after dialysis to maintain the desired therapeutic effect. Patients and their caregivers outside the dialysis clinic also need to understand and care for the vascular access. Once hemodialysis is initiated after accessing the blood vessels, it is a continuous process in which the blood is pumped from their body to the dialyzer for filtration and then back to the patient. Usually no more than 250 mils of blood is in the dialysis circuit at any given time and blood is usually pumped at 400 mils per minute, such that in a four hour period, approximately 96 liters of blood pass through the dialyzer. In order for this to occur, a high flowing vascular access must be created. There are three types of vascular access that can be used to access the blood during hemodialysis. They are an arteriovenous fistula, an arteriovenous graft, and a central venous catheter. In order to start hemodialysis, Patients are referred to a vascular surgeon for evaluation and creation or placement of a vascular access. It is recommended that access planning start six months prior to needing dialysis so that the access has time to heal or mature. An arteriovenous fistula is the recommended access for most patients on hemodialysis. An AVF is the internal connection of an artery or vein, and vein in the patient's arm. This creates an enlarged high flow vein, which becomes the site for needle placement during dialysis. Because an AVF consists of the person's native artery and vein, it has the lowest risk of complications and lasts the longest. An arteriovenous graft should be placed if the patient's veins are not large enough or healthy enough to be used for an AVF. With an AVG, 
an artery and a vein are surgically connected by a grafted tube tunneled under the skin, either in the patient's forearm, upper arm or thigh. Needles are then placed into the graft at the beginning of hemodialysis treatments. While synthetic grafts are more common, biologic grafts, either bovine or cryopreserved human vessels, are sometimes used. Infection, stenosis and thrombosis are more likely with AVGs than AVFs, which is why fistulas are preferred. Central venous catheters are the third option and should only be used temporarily while a peripheral access, either an AVF or an AVG is healing and or maturing. The hemodialysis catheter is a dual lumen tube that is usually placed in the patient's jugular vein with the tip in the right atrium. Blood is removed through one lumen and returned through the other continuously during dialysis with a flow of about 400 mils per minute. Central venous catheters have a very high risk of infection and malfunction and should be avoided if at all possible. Infection is the leading cause of hospitalization and the second leading cause of death in hemodialysis patients. A dialysis nurse or technician will assess the patient's access at every treatment to help ensure proper function or detect the presence of pathology. All healthcare providers should be able to listen for the brewery, which is the noise of turbulent blood flow, and feel the thrill, which is the vibration of blood flowing through a fistula or graft. The absence of either of these should trigger an urgent consult with an expert. Many times that expert is the alert patient himself as he has been taught how to assess his access daily. Physical examination is a highly reliable form of access assessment and diagnostic studies are usually only necessary when a problem has been diagnosed via physical exam. The following safety alerts are, are as advised. The needles needed for hemodialysis are large, usually around 15 gauge, and the flow through the access and pressure in the access is high. At the end of the treatment, the dialysis staff holds pressure over the needle holes till bleeding stops and places an adhesive cover for the early post-treatment period. Pressure bandages that could prevent flow through the access should not be used. Breakthrough bleeding should be reported and treated with appropriate point pressure. Several hours after treatment, needle sites should be inspected to confirm healing. Blood pressure should not be measured nor IVs inserted into the access arm. AV accesses can be damaged by careless blood pressure monitoring or IV placement in the access arm. Similarly, healthy veins that could be used for fistula creation can be damaged by thoughtless IV placement or poor phlebotomy. Many patients will have an access alert bracelet or card with them and signs should be posted in the hospital rooms of patients with CKD. It is no exaggeration to say that the patient's vascular access is his lifeline. Dialysis nurses are taught to look, listen and feel the arteriovenous access for complications. Stenosis, which is the narrowing of the access vessel, is the most common complication and is characterized by lower flow and increased pressure. In fistulas and grafts, stenosis can be caused by scarring of the vessel wall due to needle injury, infiltration, and hematoma formation during hemodialysis, secondary to improper cannulation technique. The brewery is most likely to have a high-pitched sound in the presence of a stenosis. The most common site of stenosis in grafts is at the venous anastomosis. 
Stenosis can lead to thrombosis of an access. The treatment for stenosis is angioplasty, a procedure to widen the small segment that is narrowed. Long segments of stenosis may require surgery to revise or replace the narrowed segment. Aneurysmal dilatation can occur due to vessel trauma from frequent needle punctures in the same area and or pressure from a downstream stenosis. Steel syndrome is a painful ischemic condition caused by the access stealing blood from the extremity, usually the hand. Steel syndrome requires thorough assessment and sometimes surgery to prevent the loss of tissue and function. All arteriovenous access creation changes the body's hemodynamics, primarily through increased cardiac output. Extreme cases of high output have been seen in some large fistulas and require surgical revision to prevent heart failure. Infection is much less common in AV fistulas than in AV grafts and catheters, but can occur due to poor aseptic technique at cannulation and or poor hygiene of the patient. While such complications as the one shown on this slide should be managed as an emergency at the dialysis center, every caregiver should be aware that such aneurysms can and do fatally rupture in the home setting. All such complications should be questioned by all caregivers. Bacteremic infection is the most common complication with hemodialysis catheters, frequently leading to hospitalization and sometimes death. Local infections at the exit site and in the catheter tunnel also occur. Prevention is key and is discussed later in this module as part of the dialysis treatment. Catheter malfunction presenting with low flows may be due to poor placement technique, retraction of the catheter, a cracked hub, broken clamps, or thrombosis fibrin sheath formation. Depending on the cause, clot lysing medications, such as tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, or catheter replacement may be required. Catheters can clot when they are used for lab draws or medication administration and or lack of maintenance. Hemodialysis catheters should only be used for hemodialysis. Because of their high risk for complications, catheters should only be used for dialysis access when absolutely necessary and for as short a time as possible. This safety alert is to help prevent infection of the CVC. It includes no swimming, showering or tub baths while a CVC is in place. Change the dressing only if it is soiled. Report any purulent drainage to the dialysis center nurse and monitor patient temperature daily. Central venous catheters can also malfunction due to mechanical issues such as those that are poorly placed, retraction of the catheter which exposes the cuff, cracked hubs or broken clamps, also obstruction due to blood clots or fibrin sheath formation. All of these issues create the need for catheter replacement. The long-term complication of catheter placement is central venous stenosis and occlusion which complicates the creation of a fistula or graft, future catheter placements, and overall decreases patients' long-term survival. This picture shows engorgement of surface veins due to central venous stenosis. The safety alerts that need to be reported to the dialysis center nurse are as follows. An exposed catheter cuff, can lead to malposition of the catheter and infection. Broken clamps create a risk of bleeding from the catheter port. Cracked hubs create a need for catheter replacement. Caps that have become disconnected create risks of bleeding and infection. Patients have been known to accidentally pull out catheters that are poorly secured, creating a risk of internal bleeding and also infection. 
report any of these observations to the dialysis center nurse. With this next segment, we'll expand on the care of the patient during the intradialytic period. This requires a basic understanding of the procedure and the equipment, including the dialyzer, dialysis bath, dialysis machine, and the procedures for water treatment. The dialyzer, sometimes called the artificial kidney, is made up of microscopic hollow filtering fibers, the walls of which are semi-permeable. The blood is pumped through the inside of these hollow fibers and the dialysate bath is pumped around the outside. The waste products move from the blood through the pores of the semi-permeable membrane into the dialysate. The process of diffusion selectively allows particles to pass through, dependent on pore size. Blood cells and proteins are too big to pass through, but urea and creatinine move easily from the blood to the dialysate. Osmosis refers to the movement of fluid across the semi-permeable membrane. Ultrafiltration is the removal of extra fluid by the application of negative pressure to the dialysis membrane. The machine is programmed to apply enough negative pressure to remove the necessary amount of fluid to achieve the target weight. The ultra purified isotonic bath is the chemically treated water based solution that is pumped through the dialyzer on the outside of the semi permeable hollow fibers. Uremic toxins from the blood will diffuse into the dialysate fluid during dialysis and be discarded. The bath contains very specific amounts of potassium, sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, as well as the nutrients dextrose, calcium and magnesium, so that the patient's electrolyte and acid base status is balanced during and after the treatment. The hemodialysis machine has two circuits, the blood circuit and the dialysate circuit. The machine will use these two countercurrent circuits to pump the dialysate and patient's blood to and through the dialyzer. The blood will be returned to the patient and the used dialysate will be discarded via the drain pipes. While the patient's blood will pass through the dialyzer multiple times during a single treatment, the dialysate passes through just once before it is discarded. The dialysis machine also has complex sensors and alarms to detect and alert staff of any complications with the flow of either blood or dialysate during the treatment. The dialysis nurse and technician can individualize some of the settings on the machine to satisfy the dialysis prescription and meet the needs of each patient. Dialysis patients are exposed to more than 120 liters of water per treatment. This water mixes with dialysate concentrate to create a safe and effective concentration before entering the dialysate circuit of the machine. A water treatment system removes chemical and bacterial contaminants that can harm dialysis patient. Water for dialysis is treated by filtration, softeners, absorption of chlorine and chloramine by activated charcoal filters, reverse osmosis, deionization, and ultrafiltration. The purified water is tested and monitored to ensure it is safe for use before it reaches the patient. Nurses and technicians trained for this role manage the water treatment system at each dialysis unit. Dialysis water treatment is its own speciality. Guidelines for dialysis water treatment are developed by the Association for Advancement of Medi Medical Instrumentation, AMI, and adopted as regulation by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. All dialysis centers must adhere to these guidelines. 
Once the hemodialysis machine is cleaned, set up, primed, and the alarms tested, it is ready for the patient. But the patient is not ready for the dialysis machine until they meet with the nurse and dialysis technician for a pre-dialysis assessment and preparation of the vascular access. Infection control is a high priority during patient preparation and throughout the treatment. And in the times of a pandemic, infection control includes the wearing of masks by patients as well as staff. The pre-dialysis assessment starts when the patient arrives in the dialysis unit. The staff visually assesses the patient's mobility and gait for changes. The patient is questioned about problems or changes since last treatment. The patient is weighed and washes the access arm if they have an AVF or AVG with soap and water. The staff directs the patient to the assigned dialysis station where they take a standing blood pressure. The patient sits in the chair and staff takes a set of sitting vital signs, including BP, temperature, assessment of heart and lungs, and observation for edema in the face, abdomen, and lower extremities. The nurse will review pertinent lab data from the last lab draw. Discussions about any changes or symptoms are thoroughly probed by the RN and appropriate action taken as needed. The next phase of assessment is the vascular access. This assessment entails a visual inspection of the entire access. The exit site of a catheter is observed, cleaned, and the entry site dressed. Peripheral cannulation sites of an arteriovenous access are observed noting where the most recent needle placements have been and the normalcy of the healing process. The nurse or dialysis technician feels for the thrill, the vibration of the blood flow, and listens with a stethoscope to the brewy, the noise of the blood flow prior to every needle placement to ensure a functioning vascular access. KDOKI guidelines recommend a complete physical examination of the vascular access should be performed weekly by an expert while the patient is not on dialysis and should include not only inspection, palpation for thrill and auscultation of brewery, but also assessment for signs of access problems such as skin breakdown narrowing of a vessel or any signs of infection. Once the di pre-dialysis assessment of the vascular access is complete, initiating the dialysis treatment involves cleaning the access site following CDC guidelines and using strict aseptic technique. Before accessing a central venous catheter, the hub is scrubbed per CDC guidelines, and then the dwelling anticoagulant is withdrawn and both lumens flushed with saline. This must occur before the catheter is connected to the dialysis lines and the hemodialysis pump is started. If the patient has an arteriovenous access, either a fistula or a graft, the skin is cleaned as per protocol usually with chlorhexidine, and the two needles are inserted. Needle insertion should use site rotation for fistulas or grafts or buttonhole cannulation for fistulas. Once inserted, these needles are secured and the pump is started. The blood flow is set and pressures in the extracorporeal circuit are monitored throughout the treatment. Before, during, and after treatment, we must practice infection control. Remember that infection is one of the leading causes of hospitalization for our dialysis patients. Due to the amount of patient staff contact during dialysis and the frequency that patients are exposed to potentially infection sources at dialysis, infection control is of utmost importance. 
standard dialysis precautions should be used throughout the dialysis facility. Patients should be washing their hands before and after dialysis to prevent spreading germs to each other or infecting their access during the treatment. Staff must wash their hands and change gloves between each patient encounter and use aseptic technique throughout the treatment, taking care not to contaminate the vascular access or bloodlines. Due to the high risk of blood exposure and to prevent spread of bloodborne pathogens, personal protective equipment is required when staff is on the dialysis treatment floor. Gowns, masks and gloves are worn for most patient care. Patients with central venous catheters must also wear masks during the initiation and completion of dialysis or any other time the catheter lumens are exposed. Because catheters are the primary source of infection, catheter reduction is the primary preventive practice. For catheters that can't be replaced by arteriovenous access, rigorous catheter care is essential. This includes all the precautions already cited, as well as scrubbing the catheter hubs with an antiseptic pad, typically isopropyl alcohol, and allow to air dry. Safe injection practices like never reusing needles and using single use vials is also important. Immunizations against pneumonia, influenza and hepatitis B are recommended for all dialysis patients due to their increased risk of infection and increased risk of severe illness if they become infected with one of these diseases. All dialysis facilities must have a continuous quality improvement process for tracking in infections. The CDC poster shown here very nicely illustrates the complexity of infection control in assisted hemodialysis facilities. During the COVID-19 pandemic, staff assisted hemodialysis changed to include daily temperature screening of patients and staff prior to entry. Visitors were prohibited in most clinics. Mandatory hand washing and hand hygiene for staff and patients, mandatory PPE for staff, which includes gowns, gloves, goggles, or shields, and masks when near patients. Patients were required to wear a mask throughout the entire treatment. COVID-19 positive patients or those with flu symptoms were placed in isolation or a separate area from the negative patients. Facility management required increased attention to the disinfection and cleaning of the environment and telehealth visits were allowed for the medical providers regular visits. Nursing homes and assisted living centers saw a rise of the use of assisted hemodialysis within the center during COVID-19. This was allowed through waivers from CMS and provided treatment. Most congregate settings tested patients and staff regularly for the virus. Other precautions for these settings were similar to the, to the to those used in the dialysis centers. Routine treatment of conventional, that is three times per week hemodialysis has been taking place in assisted facilities for over 40 years in the US. But even with best practices and safety precautions in place, complications do occur. This chart lists the most common events their usual causes and the potential treatments for them. Most facilities have standing orders that the nurse follows to treat these complications. More information about these potential complications, along with what patients experience between conventional hemodialysis treatments, can be found in ANNA's core curriculum for nephrology nursing. The next set of slides describes that experience and the care that inpatient 
or long-term care nurses might provide during the interdialytic period. The best way to learn about the care for dialysis patients is to communicate with the staff who have been dialyzing them for weeks and perhaps years. Communication between the long-term care or hospital unit and the hemodialysis staff is of utmost importance, especially when the patient is being discharged from the hospital back to the outpatient dialysis facility. For the nurse in a long-term care facility, establishing a rapport with dialysis staff will facilitate meaningful communication. It helps to learn the names of those who can receive and provide patient information. Is a priority for the patient will help avoid conflicts with other appointments, procedures, or therapies. It is always helpful for the dialysis staff to be made aware of any complications that may have occurred during hospitalization or between treatments, especially if the patient is unable to cogently communicate. Providing a report before treatment using the SBAR format, that is Situation Background Assessment Recommendation, is very helpful. Patient background or history might include DNR and, and advanced directive status, isolation precautions, recent surgery or procedures, changes in medications, and allergies. Additionally, inform hemodialysis staff of any significant changes in patients' condition since the last treatment, especially any changes related to fluid status. Specifically note, weights performed using a bed scale. Linens and bed position should be standardized. Comparison of daily weight to target weight for volume status. Vital signs and changes in intake and output, including whether oral intake increases or decreases. And any fluid restriction, urine output, stool consistency, or any output from drains such as chest tubes, nasogastric suction, and wounds. For acute care discharges, inform the hemodialysis staff if any antibiotic or iron therapy needs to be administered during dialysis. Check the vascular access when the patient returns from dialysis and at each shift change to assure hemostasis from the needle sites and that the fistular graft is patent. Patency means having adequate blood flow. Thus, you need to listen with your stethoscope to hear the brewy and palpate for the thrill. Needle site pressure dressings can usually be safely removed upon return. Take note of skin breakdown or drainage or bleeding from the access site. For the patient with a hemodialysis catheter, assess exit site condition, noting any redness, irritation, or purulent drainage. Review the date the dressing was changed was last performed and ensure that the end caps are secure. In most cases, the dialysis staff will do all catheter dressing changes and flushes. Remember, dialysis catheters should never be used for routine phlebotomy. Also keep in mind that some patients may have both types of access as their new fistula or graft is maturing or they're awaiting declotting of their fistula or graft. Be sure to assess and document the condition of both accesses. Perform blood pressure checks on the patient's non-fistula or graft arm to avoid impeding blood flow to the site, which could cause poor blood flow during dialysis. Communicate and emphasize the importance of this to support staff, such as nurses' aides and, or technicians. Post signage above the patient's bed or on, white, on whiteboards to communicate access sites and care. Dialysis patients need to be weighed daily for proper fluid management. 
the same scale should be used. If using a bed scale, ensure proper zeroing and remove pillows and blankets. Fluid and salt restrictions are the most difficult to manage. Water pitchers that are provided upon admission, visitors bring, bringing in drinks, water fountains, ice chips, and poor communication between the team regarding the patient's consumption are just some variables that may contribute to excess volume. The correct diet should be ordered along with prescribed phosphate binders, which need to be taken when the patient eats. Any delay in taking phosphate binders may decrease efficacy of the binding. Potassium is the most dangerous electrolyte for patients in the interdialytic period. Unusual symptoms such as arrhythmia, bradycardia, and or generalized weakness require assessing intake, especially for high potassium foods, such as bananas, oranges, potatoes, or tomatoes, to determine whether there is any need for urgent lab work and possibly dialysis. High but unsymptomatic lab values require diet evaluation. Even a routine hemodialysis treatment can trigger complications in the patient. Common complications following a hemodialysis treatment can be very similar to those that occur during treatment and include hypotension, hypoglycemia, cramps, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and vascular access issues. Hypotension is the most common complication of hemodialysis. Low blood pressure occurs when too much fluid is removed or fluid is removed too rapidly during dialysis. The dialysis machine is so programmed to remove a predetermined amount of fluid, but when that removal exceeds refill from the extravascular spaces, low blood volume and hypotension occur. This often results in nausea and vomiting. Limiting fluid intake as recommended by the dialysis team may help prevent low blood pressure during and after dialysis. However, some medications for high blood pressure should not be withheld as it could contribute to a hypotensive event. Check the specific prescription instructions or call the dialysis nurse. As you can see from the list shown here, there are a variety of other reasons that patients may have low blood pressure, from vascular access bleeding to systemic disease to staph error. A thorough assessment of the patient is the first step in the nursing process. An assessment for hypotension begins with noting the presence or absence of the symptoms lifted, listed here. Keep in mind that hypotension presents with different signs and symptoms depending on the individual. But for all patients, the blood pressure measurement is below average. When checking blood pressure, use a manual cuff and check the blood pressure with the patient lying, sitting and standing as the patient's condition permits to observe for orthostatic changes. If the patient is not mobile, simulate sitting and standing by taking BP with the head of the bed down and then with it elevated at an 80 to 90 degree angle. Always treat the patient, not the number, paying attention to how the patient feels. Treatment will depend on the assessed cause, locality of an event, severity of the patient's condition, and response to first aid, which can include elevating the patient's legs to increase blood return to the heart, administering oxygen if available, giving fluids if indicated, and calling rapid response as needed. Preventing recurrence is key and begins with determining the cause. Review the following. With the dialysis staff, evaluate the patient's pre-dialysis weight for accuracy. Consider the scale used, patient's clothes, linens, and the time of day. 
review the patient's medication list for BP medications. If a new target weight is established, the patient may no longer need their antihypertensive meds. Always communicate this type of occurrence with the dialysis staff and nephrologist so that next treatment can be modified. Keep in mind that even patients who are not showing signs of hypotension are likely to feel drained and wrung out after hemodialysis. They are. Removing several liters or pounds of fluid in a very short time may be necessary, but it can be very debilitating. It takes several hours for the body to recover from dialysis, with most patients needing to rest for the remainder of the day, not recovering usual activity until the next day. Remember that in addition to rest, patients need food, especially diabetic patients. Most facilities do not allow food or drinks during dialysis and patients spent several hours receiving treatment. As a result, hypoglycemia can occur in diabetic patients with all the usual signs and symptoms. It is important to check the patient's blood sugar along with his or her blood pressure and history of such events as quickly as possible to confirm hypoglycemia. Treatment for the suspected hypoglycemic event depends on the patient's history and the cause, location, and severity of the event. The suggested treatment illustrated here assumes a healthcare environment and a patient who can eat and drink. In this case, the patient should eat a food or, or drink a beverage containing 15 grams of carbohydrate. This might be half a cup of apple juice or two to four pieces of hard candy. Do not give a patient orange juice due to its high potassium content. Retest the patient's blood sugar after 15 minutes. If it's still less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, have the patient consume another 15 grams of carbohydrate. Again, recheck the patient's blood sugar in 15 minutes. If it's still less than 70, have the patient consume another portion of food or beverage containing 15 grams of carbohydrate. If it's above 70 milligrams per deciliter, have the patient eat a small snack like half of a turkey sandwich, followed by a meal within the next hour. Since blood sugar may begin to drop after 40 to 60 minutes, Test again after one hour to make sure the patient's blood sugar is in the range of 70 to 115 milligrams per deciliter. Again, prevention is key and patients at risk for hypoglycemia should have snacks available in the peridialytic period. Sometimes when fluid is taken out of the body at a fast rate during dialysis or too much fluid is removed, the muscles react by cramping. Muscle cramps may occur in the patient's extremities, stomach or chest. Cramps can be extremely painful and patients may try to stand up to relieve muscle cramping in the legs, which puts them at risk for hypotension and falling. Ensure that the patient's electrolytes are in balance. Performing leg stretches with assistance or requesting physical therapy can help to decrease the occurrence of cramping. Inform the dialysis staff of cramping incidents so they can review the patient's treatment records and recent electrolyte labs. The dialysis staff may adjust the treatment parameters as well as recommend remedies for future occurrences. Post dialysis complications can also occur at home and be both frightening and uncomfortable for the patient and the family. An important part of the nursing process is patient and family education. The following slides will outline the patient education necessary for both intradialytic and interdialytic periods. Dialysis patients need to be educated about their routine care, including their vascular access, weight, 
accurate intake and output, blood pressure checks, prescribed medications, especially taking phosphate binders with meals, and keeping scheduled hemodialysis treatment appointments, as well as how to manage potential hemodialysis complications. Before beginning patient education, consider the patient's health literacy and individualize the approach with sensitivity to the patient's and family's cultural and health beliefs, preferences, and wishes. We all need to educate the patient about the care, maintenance, and most importantly, protection of their vascular access. Patients should know to keep the access clean at all times, use the access site for dialysis only, be careful not to bump or cut the access, to not put a blood pressure cuff on the access arm, and not wear jewelry or tight clothes over the access site. Anything that leaves a mark on the skin is too tight. They should not sleep with the access arm under their head or body. And most importantly, they need to check the thrill and brewery in their access at least once a day. If the patient has a catheter, education is needed about vascular access options and the steps the patient will need to take to achieve a successful fistula or graft if appropriate. Also teach the patient about securing the catheter safely to their skin. Using a mirror is helpful for this. Teach them too to ensure that the caps are on and secure and that the catheter dressing is intact, clean and dry, which is essential to preventing infection. Teach the patient that the best protection is to only use the catheter for hemodialysis treatments and that any post-dialysis bleeding or fever should be reported immediately to the dialysis staff. Most patients on dialysis are required to be on a fluid restriction. You can help the patient by teaching them to measure their fluids and by removing the water pitcher from their bedside. Daily weights are needed for the patient on hemodialysis. Patients need to understand that strictly keeping their dialysis appointment is essential to their well being, as is the prescribed time that their blood is going through the dialyzer. This not only prevents uremia, but also helps manage their blood pressure, fluid and phosphorus level, which brings us to the complex subject of diet. While the dialysis facility has a dietitian on staff to educate the patient, we as nurses need to follow up with basic nutritional guidance. Patients on hemodialysis needs to focus on eating high biological proteins such as meat, fish and eggs, low potassium foods such as grapes, apples and green beans, while avoiding bananas, orange juice, tomatoes, potatoes and avocado. They need to maintain a low phosphorus by avoiding dairy products, beans and prepackaged foods. A low sodium diet helps patients on hemodialysis avoid thirst. High sodium foods to avoid are canned soups, MSG, and prepackaged foods with high amounts of preservatives. Salt substitute products should be avoided because they are typically a potassium based product, and if consumed, patients' potassiums could rise to life threatening levels. Other routine care includes blood pressure checks, blood sugar checks, even if insulin is greatly reduced, taking prescribed medications as directed, especially phosphate binders with meals, and exercise as tolerated. Post-dialysis bleeding from needle sites is common and patients need to know how to hold pressure and get help. Teach patients the importance of hand hygiene in preventing infection. If the patient has a catheter as their vascular access, ensure that the patient and staff wear masks during dressing changes and the initiation and termination of dialysis treatments in order to prevent infection. 
patients need to know to call for assistance when first getting in or out of their bed or chair. All our patients are at increased risk for falls post dialysis because of the potential for orthostatic hypotension. Patients with a femoral catheter are bed bound. Educate the patients on the signs and symptoms of low vascular volume and hypotension, including blurry vision, confusion, dizziness, fainting, lightheadedness, nausea or vomiting, sleepiness and or weakness. Low blood pressure doesn't mean to withhold medication or give fluid without a physician's order. If a cramp starts, the patient should alert a healthcare team member immediately to get help in alleviating the discomfort. Instruct the patient on ways to prevent cramps, such as performing leg exercises during treatment, and most importantly, adhering to the fluid restriction. Similarly, it may be necessary to review with diabetic patients the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, such as double, blur double or blurry vision fast or pounding heartbeat, headache, hunger, shaking or trembling, sweating, tingling or numbness of the skin, tiredness or weakness. Diabetic patients should eat prior to going to dialysis and have a snack ready post dialysis. <clears throat> Fatigue is probably the most common complication following hemodialysis treatments and is generally correlated to the amount of fluid being removed. Exercise can help fight fatigue. Instruct patients to exercise to tolerance early on their days off from dialysis. Walking is the best and safest exercise. Patients should collaborate with the interdisciplinary team if fatigue is preventing normal activities. Fatigue can also indicate anemia. Teach patients about red blood cells, hemoglobin, and iron. Knowing their lab values and normal numbers is important. Encourage them to ask if their red blood, red blood cell counts are at target levels or if they will need a treatment change. Document your education in the patient record. Include your teaching method, the patient, family, or others taught, your sense of their comprehension, and any needs for reinforcement. Communicate this directly to the dialysis staff as well. While it is not a commonly used option, there is another hemodialysis setting for those patients able and motivated to do self-care, but who have barriers to home therapy as discussed in module six. This other option is in-center self-care dialysis. With this option, the patient performs part or all of the treatment process in the dialysis center. This is unusual in the US, but is popular in Australia and Europe, especially for patients whose homes are not suitable for dialysis or who need some staff support. The nurses and staff act as educators and provide a support system. This option is not only allowed by federal regulation, but it is encouraged, as is evidenced by this quote from the regulations of 2008. If a patient expresses the desire to perform self-dialysis in center, the facility's interdisciplinary team response should incorporate assessment of that patient for self-care training and planning for the goal of self-care as appropriate. In-center hemodialysis is usually offered three times per week for four hours per session. Patients are assigned specific treatment schedules. Some centers do offer nocturnal hemodialysis three nights per week. The rigid treatment schedule and need for transportation can be a problem for some patients. This self-care in-center option is a great way for patients to feel that they have some control over their care. It gives patients confidence and may lead them to doing home hemodialysis, giving them more scheduling flexibility and better patient outcomes. 
There is an even more compelling reason to actualize and increase self-care dialysis for our patients. Consider this pertinent definition of self-care hemodialysis by Susan Bray. It is a modality which introduces the patient into a continuum of care ranging from dependency to independence. Greater knowledge of the dialytic process itself is achieved. It is thus a means by which patients can again achieve an active and meaningful lifestyle associated with a feeling of physical and emotional well-being. The concept of self-care dialysis aligns with Dorothea Oram's nursing theory based on her philosophy that all patients wish to care for themselves. This is where nurses shine. Nurses determine these deficits and define a support modality to meet them until such time as the patient is able to assume this care himself, the point when the deficit no longer exists. In doing so, patients are enabled and empowered to care for themselves, knowing that they have a partner in care, the nurse. Together, the nurse and patient can explore the self-care dialysis options available. Nephrology nurses actualize this with the aid of our scope of practice and standards of care, knowing that patient control of the learning process and personal involvement in the treatment and rehabilitation process increase adherence and improve quality of life. And in doing self-care, so many patients can also realize the more subtle benefits of self-management as outlined here in Roberta Curtin's definition. Self-management of CKD requires learning new skills, which may include changing behaviors, managing medical aspects, and interpreting and reporting symptoms. Other skills that may be required are learning to seek out and use resources effectively and forging a different, more collegial relationship with the healthcare provider. Truly patient-centered care means individualizing the care to that particular patient. And while there are standards and guidelines, every individual is different and knows himself better than we ever can. While peritoneal dialysis is a, usually a home self-care therapy, it may become an assisted therapy in a hospital or long-term care facility. If the patient is in hospital and needs to start dialysis urgently, it is becoming more common for PD rather than hemodialysis to be instituted to avoid the placement of a central venous catheter. The hospital dialysis staff will do the PD treatment with a machine and the patient will later be trained to do self-care PD once they are discharged from hospital. If the patient is already on PD and is hospitalized for acute care of another condition, they may not be able to manage their PD as well and will require help from the hospital staff. Non-nephrology nurses will be involved with their general CKD management, especially diet and medications, which are very similar to those for the patient on hemodialysis. There are also some patients receiving PD in long-term care facilities who are unable to perform their, perform their own dialysis. However, staff at those facilities are specially trained to assist. Peritoneal dialysis uses the peritoneal membrane as its filter for fluid and waste products. The peritoneal cavity and membrane is accessed by an implanted peritoneal catheter. PD can be a continuous treatment with exchanges of peritoneal dialysate fluid being done manually both day and night, which is known as continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, CAPD. Or more likely, PD can be done using a machine to cycle approximately four exchanges throughout the night while the patient sleeps, with perhaps one ambulatory exchange performed manually during the day. This is called continuous cycloperitoneal dialysis, also known as automated PD. 
Hospitalized patients on PD will have their prescription adjusted as necessary to their acute con care condition. More information on PD can be found in module six of this series, which details home dialysis. The number of people in the US experiencing chronic kidney disease leading to kidney failure is growing so that there are more needing kidney replacement therapy. These data show that the overwhelming majority of our kidney failure patients who are receiving life-saving assisted hemodialysis center are elderly, have serious comorbid diseases also requiring treatment, and who don't have the life expectancy that the younger, healthier patients doing self-care or living with a kidney transplant have. But what we nephrology nurses know who have given care to these patients many hours per week over the span of many years is that our patients are there for quality of life, if not quantity. It is the wish to see children and grandchildren grow and prosper, to attend weddings and graduations, and the chance to hold that newest baby. And the Kidney Disease Quality of Life Survey published in 2018 supports that knowledge. Our patients know better than anyone else that life is difficult, often painful, and inevitably short. We know that many of you share our care of them. Please see the next module in this series on how we are try to offer patient-centered quality of life at Our patients know better than anyone that life is difficult, often painful, and inevitably short. We know that many of you share our care of them. Please see the next module in this series on how we try to offer patient-centered quality of life care at the end of life. Thank you. For more information on chronic kidney disease and kidney replacement therapies in both adults and children, please see these other modules on the ANNA website. Thank you for the care you give our CKD patients and for choosing to learn more about them and their therapies through these modules. You can download from the online library a PDF copy of these slides, the printed narrative, case studies, post-test, as well as a list of references and resources, and a link to the glossary of terms. Many nurses have volunteered their time and expertise as content authors and reviewers for these modules. Their names are listed in alphabetical order. ANNA thanks them all for their talent and service. For more information about CKD care and the ANNA, please visit our website and online library. Thank you.